Welcome back. For the next couple of lectures, we're going to be dealing with baleage, which is round baled silage. First points I want to make are just some basic steps to make good baleage. Cut early so you have more fermentable sugar. Achieve a moisture content of 40% to 60%, and that usually means wilting about one day more or less, and we'll talk a lot more about that a little later. We want to bale tight. That helps exclude air, and it helps have good fermentation. We want to wrap the bales quickly, wrap them the same day, and that prevents heating. We want to use six or more layers of plastic, and that helps to reach and, uh, and uh, uh, preserve a state of anaerobiasis. In other words, we want that, uh, that helps the bale to stay anaerobic because making silage is an anaerobic process. We want to let the ensiling go on for 30 days before we try to feed or test the bales because that allows for that fermentation to fully complete. And then we want to test for the quality and fermentation so that we have safe feeding <clears throat> and plug holes in the bales, the bales that you make or the holes that you make from uh, taking samples or the holes that occur from maybe from uh, rodents or other type of uh, animals that will pick at the plastic uh, or sometimes we just have tears that occur. So plug in those holes is very important to prevent botulism and listeriosis, which are two serious problems that can happen with baleage. So silage fermentation is a cascading process and, and we are gonna just uh, touch the basics or the top of this uh, process, but here's the way that it works. What you're looking at now is just a scale, the days after baling one through 28. Right after we bale and we wrap, the growth of bacteria are acetic acid producing bacteria and they will begin to drop the pH. After about a week or a little more, the lactic acid bacteria begin to be favored and then they will complete the fermentation to at the end of about four weeks. This is in general what happens with the bale pH starts out about 6 or 6.5, and you'd like to get it as low as 3.8, like in this uh, slide. However, most of the time, our baleage uh, is not going to get this low. It's going to be between 4 and 5, and sometimes a little above 5. Uh, this is a, excuse me, this is uh, the line for the typical uh, pH drop with something like corn silage, which is much easier to ferment than um, long-stemmed uh, wet forage. So why do we make baleage? Well, first and foremost, it helps us to manage weather, and by that I mean it helps us avoid rain damage. So we are more likely to be able to cut the forage on time. When we cut on time, we have higher forage quality. Because we don't have outside storage losses, we have less dry matter loss in storage with haylage or baleage. And, and if you, for the purposes of, of class for us, when I say haylage, I'm going to mean baleage uh, because most of the time, most of the forage that is made into, that is ensiled in Kentucky is going to be in round bales. So we, that's why we call it baleage. Let me just make a few points about what, uh, what uh, the, of the benefits that, about uh, making baleage or round bale silage. This is a study that was done in 1994, looking at the at, at three different moisture contents, 54, 49, 43, uh, and making baleage, and then going ahead and letting that forage dry to down to haymaking moisture. If you look <clears throat> at the crude protein contents, uh, the moisture it is, the higher the crude protein content, because we have less leaf loss and leaf shatter with that alfalfa. When you get down to the haymaking moisture, by the time you've, you've cut it, you've let it lay in the field, maybe you had to run a tether across it, and then you've baled it, you have lost a lot of the leaves and hence the protein. So one of the benefits of uh, the quality benefits of making baleage is, is this, the fact that with legumes, 
we tend to preserve more of the leaves. In that same uh, study, that alfalfa round bell silage, those three uh, lots of silage had very high energy contents, 64, 65, 64, but the hay was down at about 53, again, because you've had to uh, let it dry in the field and you've lost a lot of leaves. And comparing this as a storage system, this alfalfa hay was left outside uh, and allowed the weather compared to the storage losses with the haylage. And you can see very little storage loss with the haylage uh, and quite a bit, I, I would say normal storage losses for outside stored alfalfa grass hay uh, in Kentucky weather. Let's talk a little bit about the equipment that we need. We do um, get help by having uh, with curing stems by using mower conditioners. And ag again, I think most of the mower conditioners that I've seen in Kentucky are the intermeshing roller kinds, but that does help us with crimping of the stems. Heavier adjustable rakes are desired because this is going to be a, a heavier crop, and sometimes you're going to need to be able to adjust them so that you may can uh, maybe have a wider uh, swath or a wider windrow or a more narrow windrow, but heavier rakes in general are desired. Most of the rakes in Kentucky are wheel rakes. We, we are going to need a heavy duty or a silage baler, and there are kits that allow uh, balers to be modified so that they do a better job handling the wet forage, but it is the wet forage that uh, create, creates quite a strain on the baler. So you do need to have some sort of a uh, baler modification or selective baler that is built in, uh, for the high moisture forage. And the wrapper that we may use is going to be uh, either an individual wrapper or an inline wrapper, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. The types of forage crops that we can make into to haylage or baleage uh, basically are wide open. Uh, all of the forages are going to be able to be made into haylage. Now I will tell you that grasses are easier to make into haylage <clears throat> or baleage than legumes because they uh, actually is, is kind of uh, non-intuitive. The legumes have higher protein. That protein actually, whenever you have those bales made, the protein actually gets deaminated, releasing ammonia. When you release ammonia in a bale, it actually causes the pH to rise a little bit. So <clears throat> the, the proteins in legumes wind up buffering the pH change that we want uh, in um, baleage. So grasses typically have lower protein, so therefore they don't have as much of that buffering of pH change. It's non-intuitive, like I said. The most frequent crops that we make into haylage are the small grains, alfalfa and alfalfa grass mixes, clover grass mixes, and one I didn't list here uh, is the uh, sorghum sudans or the summer annual type forage crops. Let's talk about the proper moisture content for baleage, and this is really important. Uh, although you can uh, read several places that the moisture range for making uh, baleage is 40 to 60%, the range may be 35 to 65 and even higher, but as you're going to see in the next lecture, having the moisture content closer to 60 and 65 percent makes for better lactic acid production. Since moisture content is so important, we'll talk a little bit later about the methods of moisture measurement, the dish rag test, the microwave test, and then windrow and bale probes. I said moisture content was important, and here's a study that, that really does uh, show that. This is, again, alfalfa baleage pH with a moisture content, the green bar being 61% at baling or, and 50% at baling and 37%. So this is that almost that complete range from 60% moisture to 50 to 40. And you can look at the pH at 4.5, about 4.8, and then about 5.3 or 5.2 for the driest. So moisture content had uh, a large effect on the final bale pH. And you'll see that again and again with the results I'm going to show you. I wanted to show you this uh, study 
uh, that was of the drying rates of alfalfa cut in July and September, and I'm going to use it to try to, to uh, tease out how long bales should uh, we should wait before baling. So let's take a look at what we're looking at on this graph. First of all, the vertical contents, the moisture content. This is the time after cutting. That'd be cutting it in the morning. There's the middle of the day. There's the end of the day, and so on. This is the, a second cutting of alfalfa and a third cutting of alfalfa. That's July on the left and September on the right. This is Pennsylvania. Now you've got two lines here. The top line is the one we're going to be using, the dotted lines or dotted dashed lines. The solid lines is a treatment with potassium carbonate, which is a drying agent. So let's take a look at, uh, let's superimpose the correct moisture contents on this graph and see how long we should wait before we should uh, bale this material. If you look at the second cutting, that's July, the forage starts out at very close to 80% moisture, 78 to 80, which is normal, and it, it reaches 60% moisture here, actually at about the middle of the day, the first day, and at 40%, it's, in other words, it falls uh, down here, it's, we're all good, uh, and we get below 40% as of about the middle of the morning on the second day. So in summer, half a day's wilting is going to be fine, or if you can bail most of it, the very first thing the next morning, even with the dew on it, you're going to achieve pretty good moisture contents. So the, the point I want to make, there are several points to make here, but the point I main one point I want to make is that in summer, when there is sunlight and some dry and pretty good drying conditions, we very quickly fall into the proper moisture content for making haylage or baleage. Let's look at the third cutting, and you can tell by the slope of these lines that this must have been a cooler situation and maybe a little wetter uh, here in September because you can see that it took us all well into the middle of the first day, middle of the afternoon before we got down to 60% moisture and we stayed good on moisture all the way into the middle of the second afternoon. So uh, again, as I'm going to show you, we're probably going to want to have moisture contents above 50%, so that, but that still gives us when the, the drying conditions are uh, less favorable for good drying, then we have a little bit wider time before uh, when we can bail. But again, you can see that here we bailed, we cut the first day, and by that, right after lunch, we're ready to go. Uh, so the uh, thing to remember then is that when you uh, are working with, uh, you, I would say, any, any part of the growing season where there's sunlight uh, and any kind of breeze at all, we're going to, uh, to reach good baleage moisture in half a day or so. So what happens, uh, one of the principles about making baleage is cut down, which you can bale and wrap the same day. So what happens when we delay wrapping? It leads to bale heating. And let's take a look. This is uh, uh, what happens when you bale hay wet and then or uh, in, in baleage moistures or haylage moistures, and then you don't wrap it at all. It's 100 degrees at wrapping. Day one is 121, two, four is, day four is 150, and then it cools down. When we don't, uh, when we wrap, in other words, there is no delay, then we're, we start off and we maintain basically the same ambient temperature or less uh, as it was at wrapping. So there's no heating. When we wait a day, you can tell that we do get a moderate amount of heating. When we wait two days, then we're getting up into some very high temperatures. And waiting four days, we're approaching 150 degrees, which is a, a very high temperature for uh, bale heating. In fact, it's very close to spontaneous combustion. So since moisture content is so important, then that windrow management is going to be important because that's how we manage for moisture. So uh, there are a couple of options with windrow management. Uh, when you when to make a wide swath, and if, you're, if your mower allows this option of making a wider or narrow swath, Early on, or heavy crops or for first cutting, make a wide swath. You want the maximum solar radiation interception so that it does dry uh, in that part of our year where the drying conditions are not very good. When, you've, uh, when you need to make or when it's advantageous to make a narrow swath, 
is when you have a thin crop or when we're talking about midsummer and you're worried about preserving moisture. So it, it actually helps you to save time or conserve moisture so that you stay in that good range of moisture content longer. Let's talk about raking for uh, just a minute. I told you that uh, heavier adjustable rakes are good. In this case, we had a bit of a thin crop and being able to move the rake out and to cover uh, to move more forage in was an advantage. But another thing you need to realize is this is a, a wheel rake, and we talked about wheel rakes in the hay production lecture, that they, are act they actually work because these tines are almost or at the ground level and have to be, they uh, actually move the hay or, or haylage by, by the fact that it strikes these wheels and then it, it moves them back into a windrow. So one of the problems that we have discovered is that when you have this is adjusted so that these are these tines are really hard and low and aggressively scratching the ground is it can move a lot of ash or minerals or dirt into the hay or haylage and uh, and this can lead to problems. Let's talk about baleage just a little bit. We do want a, the, as dense a bale as as you can, and I should put in here. We want a uniform bale. We want all the bales the same size. It helps us, particularly with um, the inline wrappers, where you're making a long row of of the of bales uh, wrapped up in a in plastic. Um, when you have bales the same size, then they match up good end to end, and the plastic seals well. When there's a lot of height difference from bale to bale, then that stretches the plastic, and there's not as good of a seal and oxygen does get in at those junctures and leads to some mold production on the edge of those bales. There are balers that have integrated into their uh, mechanics knives right after the pickup where the forage is moved into the throat of the baler. That's where these knives are. They can be engaged and when they're engaged they chop that forage. It aids in fermentation uh, it actually aids in whenever you, if you have to mix this in rations because once you take the net wrap off of these bales, they just absolutely fall apart. Uh, it absolutely will, will result in a denser bale, and it does require higher horsepower tractors. Let's talk about uh, the wrapping process and choosing the site for baleage storage. With a tube wrapper, you want a smooth surface and, and watch out for sharp stems that can puncture the plastic. You want it to be accessible with equipment and you want to start at the bottom of the hill that compresses the row of bales as the bales are wrapped. With an individual wrapper, you still want that smooth surface, but you've got thicker plastic on the flat sides of the bales that give you more insurance against punctures. You do want it to be accessible, and and you'd like it to be close to the feeding area. You can move individual bales a lot easier if you've got a squeeze, or you can choose to even move them with a uh, a bale fork or bale prong, but you've got to, to close those holes or tape up those holes. We do want to wrap bales the same day. Use good plastic. Uh, Sunfilm is uh, one of the uh, really good brands, but just uh, use high-quality plastic. Use a minimum of four layers, and that's what a lot of the literature is going to say. But we have gone to, to recommending six or more layers of plastic, not because four doesn't work, but because that six uh, to eight gives you more insurance against punctures and things like that. Uh, and, you know, you can also get punctures from stemmy material inside the forage. And we should wait 30 days before sampling and plug holes after we sample, and plug holes, any holes that occur in those bales. This is an individual wrapper. This one happens to be a, a platform wrapper that, that rotates around and applies the plastic and then rolls it off the back. Talked about the wrapping uphill with an inline wrapper. It's a good practice. It helps jam the bales together you wind up with less air in that long tube, and it's easier to reach and maintain anaerobic conditions, particularly at the bale joints. Alfalfa that has been ensiled, or round bales that have been ensiled, can have a palatability uh, uh, advantage 
uh, if, get, if everything is, else is the same, same hay quality. This is a study done here in Lexington with alfalfa round bale silage versus that same alfalfa harvested as hay with different layers of plastic, hay versus, and you can see the ring feeders out there. On the left is the hay. There's the six layer, the two layer, and the four layer. So if you look at the storage treatment, hay down to, and two layers, four layers, and six layers, the consumption increased with each increment. So, and you can see that very visibly that the six layer uh, or the silage with six layers was preferred the, the most, or the, a, 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 they consumed it quickest. They are follow, followed by the four layer, then the two layer, and then lastly by the hay. When we go to feed this, we should wait at least 30 days before feeding or before sampling so that fermentation and the baleage will be more stable when fed. And by that, I mean that the, that, that moisture, that high moisture material, when you remove the plastic or start to remove the plastic from a roll or a line of bales, uh, then the better it's fermented, the better it stays uh, free of mold and free of heating. It stays in good shape for feeding. Uh, you can certainly feed before it's 30 days. It does, it's not toxic uh, within that zero to 30 days, but fermentation will not have been complete. Once you do get a bale out, then you're going to want to consume it as fast as you can uh, in usually less than two to three days and probably less than two. Um, and it's one of the problems with uh, maybe having baleage for a small limited number of livestock if they wouldn't consume uh, the baleage in a short amount of time once you've taken it out of the plastic. And we're getting close to the end and really this uh, will take up these concerns a little bit more in more detail in the next lecture. Lecture, But if you talk to producers, or you talk to anybody who works with baleage, you're gonna, they're going to have some concerns. You're going to need to manage that process so that you don't have botulism uh, chances and by and the main way you do that is by not baling too wet. You're going to want to avoid listeriosis, which is happens with high endpoint pH above or equal to five, uh, along with some aerobic spoilage. Uh, and uh, so you're going. We're, there are ways to avoid this, but these are concerns that we have with baleage, and we want to avoid excessive mold and rapid deterioration. And sometimes that happens from baling too dry. Sometimes it happens from not enough plastic or, or having a lot of uh, uh, difference in size between bales uh, whenever they're uh, baled in an inline uh, situation. Because again, that uh, when you have big changes in the, in the diameters of bales, that plastic is having to, to uh, reach up and, and adjust to that different height and it does not seal as well more oxygen gets in and you have mold on the bales. And of course, holes in plastic lead to excessive mold and rapid deterioration. And holes in plastic also lead to this aerobic spoilage that can in some cases lead you to listeriosis problems. So that brings me to the close of this first lecture on baleage. And the next one, we're going to uh, take a look at some Kentucky results with baleage. So until next time, we'll see you later.